Hey there, Gershon from Decoding Town here. I am making this video today to show how to use Decent Sampler. The mindset here is that even though there are other videos online that show you how to program for Decent Sampler, I think that maybe watching me do it might click with some people better. Sometimes watching somebody explain something in a different way has helped me in the past, so that's why I'm making it. The instrument we are building uh, already exists. It's called the claustrophobic toy piano. There is already an NNXT version for Reason Online, and now I'm kind of converting those samples to the Decent Sampler version because not everybody uses Reason as a DAW, even though it's a great DAW. After all, everyone has their reasons for having their favorite DAW, so I'm not going to judge them on doing that. Why would I do that? All right, let's start with the beginning. I personally do not recommend downloading Appendix C boilerplate DS preset file. Why? because every time I have, I've gotten an XML error. When I try out the program, it just says, ooh, cannot parse XML every time I edit this. Now, when I use it in simplest form, uh, I just copy the boilerplate and nothing else. I don't edit anything. I don't get the XML error. So maybe it's me, maybe it's something I'm doing, but personally, it's not been working for me. Instead, I wanna show you guys a little bit quicker of a way to go about uh, starting your Decent Sampler plugin. Over here, we have this Decent Sampler XML generator on gigperformer.com. I found this through Reddit, I think. Um, many of us uh, want to kind of find hacks to do less work, and I am one of those people. So this Decent Sampler XML generator allows you to, to kind of do that. It doesn't take away all the work for you. So this is not a, oh my gosh, I can do this immediately and then I'll be done very fast. No, it does still take editing. It does still take time, but definitely saves a lot of time. So you go to the website and you can download it for Mac or Windows and it will download. And let me show you what it looks like. All right, so here it is. First, you uh, open the program, Decent Sampler XML Generator. You click Browse. In my case, I've just made a little folder on the desktop called Test, which has some samples in it. So I click test and I press OK. And now you have to tell it the first note number for the first sample. In my case, it's going to be A4. So I have to look up on the MIDI sequencing, what number is that? Let me show you how to do that. By the way, I will put links to all these resources in the description to make it easier for you to find. Over here, we have a website, inspiredacoustics.com. It has the MIDI note number on the left-hand side and the notation, uh, you know, E whatever, on the right-hand side. And you can see that over here. And here you also have the key numbers on the piano or the organ. But we're paying attention to that left-hand side there. We're looking for A4, which is, where is it? There it is, A4, concert pitch, which is number 69. So we change this to 69 and we click create. And it created a preset with these three samples. I only put three samples in the test example just to show you guys how this works to simplify it. Let's have a look at those three samples. So I am going to open this test with sublime text, which is, there it is, boom which is what I use to create these instruments. And you can see it's done a lot of the work for me. That was similar to the boilerplate. Here it has done what XML version I'm doing. You have to put this information. So it's done all that pretty well for me. And it's even put labeled knobs, which we'll see in a second on the user interface, the UI, uh, for attack release. And this one over here, sign a chorus frequency filter, and reverb. So it's done all that for me already, which is super handy. It's also figured out the notation, starting with A4, which is 69, uh, but it did get a little messed up here. I, It doesn't identify the correct note based off the file name. So uh, that is something I'll have to change by hand. So in most samples, right, you would go A4, then you'd go A sharp four, then you'd go B4, and then C, and you know, and you keep moving up at the scale that way. Uh, I am still learning about how to label my files with good names, apparently, because I did not do that quite that way. 
Uh, and in my Windows folder, it also doesn't quite organize itself very well. So I'm working on that. I think in the future, I might start um, renaming my files so that this can work more for me automatically, right? By naming them in a way that benefits me. Over here, you can see the three samples that I gave it. Now, there is something wrong here. Okay, we're going to break down. So here we have, it says sample, right? They're all in a group. I can give the group tags and stuff. I'll show you guys how to do that in a second. But if we just look at the sample coding here, the low note is 69, which is correct. That's what I said. The high note is 69, which is correct. And now it's sending the velocity, the low velocity, playing softly, to the high velocity. So that's the first thing I would edit because my samples have two dynamic layers, a soft and a loud. So my soft is going to go to 62 and my loud will go from 63 to 127, which is the max. And then setting the root note, the root note is what note is the sample playing? It is indeed 69. So it got that right. But then below you can see that for B4, it didn't get it right. Why? Well, because the piano doesn't go A to B, it goes A, A sharp, B. So it is thinking that my B is an A sharp on the MIDI notation. Now this, in part, is my own fault. If I had labeled my files in a smarter way, given them better names, I might have been able to avoid this problem and automate it. And in the future, that's definitely something I'm going to consider and maybe something you should consider if you haven't started yet. Um, but for now, I'm just gonna have to change this by hand. So that 70 would be A sharp for, so I'm gonna change it to 71 for the low note, which is also 71 for the high note, and 71 for the root note. And of course, I have to change my velocity. I'm gonna do that for both of these in one go. There we go. And then over here, we have C5. Now between B4 and C5, there is no black note on the piano. So that one does just go from B to C. When I was first starting to make instruments, I would sometimes forget that. As I was kind of going on autopilot doing these numbers, I would forget that B and C don't have a gap. And neither do uh, D and F. D and F and B and C don't have that same gap. So that's important to remember as, as you go through with this. I had to like visually check again to remind myself. I'm one of those people like once I get into the hang of it, I kind of sometimes forget things that I already know. I'm like just going on autopilot. So this is uh, 72, right? Comes after 71. And now we have the correct notation here. Now, it's important to note that what it's done here is it's just named the file name. A lot of people like to kind of be neat with how they organize their sample pack. So they'll often put a samples slash. So they'll put all their samples in a folder named samples. Or maybe they'll name it samples uh, T, C, P, uh, wait, T, T, C, T, P. So that would be samples of the claustrophobic toy piano, right? That's what the T, C, T, P stands for. It is neater to do it that way. I personally recommend organizing nicely because a lot of people, when they use your sample pack, they won't like it if that folder where they've installed it, it just has all these WAV files because that can get messy and it's annoying to find things then. So I recommend you put in a subfolder, but for this example, it's not in the subfolder. Now we're going to test this. I've saved it and we're gonna give it a little test run on Decent Sampler. Okay, so we throw it in there. And look, it is able to recognize the notes. So I have to press uh, softly. And you can hear it, it's not very loud. It's also set the volume on negative three dB. Let me make it a little louder. Okay, so that's in the simplest way how you start the sample pack. Now, some of you, if you're the personality type that just gets going, you might be stopping the video right now and just trying this out. If you want to, go ahead. 
But for those of you who want to dig a little deeper and get a little bit more understanding of what's what you're actually doing, bear with me and we're going to go a little further into all this and I'm going to show you how I made the whole thing. So I want to take a minute to go through what everything means and why it's there. And I realize this might take a while. So if you want to put me at 1.5 speed or something to speed up that process of explaining it, that's fine. It's a good time to do so. But I want to take a second to just go through so that you understand what you're actually coding or writing instead of just blindly copy and pasting it and not knowing what's wrong, which uh, is kind of what happened for me, even though I'd watched the videos of Dave Hillowitz explaining it, there was a lot of little mistakes I was making of things that maybe were inferred, but not explicitly explained. All right, so we're gonna start over here. We have the tab is main. That means the tab that you opened, this is the main thing, okay? Over here you have the UI, that's the user interface. You can see that I've put an image there, okay? The DS hyphen background and TCTP is the claustrophobic toy piano. We have to tell what width that image is going to be and what height that image is going to be. The numbers you see here are the standardized ones that Decent Sampler uses. So I just use those two because they're the standard ones. If you want, your image can be larger than this size and that way when they click and drag it and make it bigger, if they make the window of Decent Sampler bigger, it scales nicer, like it looks nicer. It doesn't look uh, like you're overstretching the photo. The layout mode, I always set it to relative and the background mode, I put it to top left. So the background is pinning to the top left corner and then goes out like that. Okay, so in this main tab of our instrument, we have all these labeled knobs. You are essentially in this just telling that this is going to be a knob that people can turn. You have to put it in position, that's the X and the Y. So starting from where we are, X and Y axis, where is this knob going to be? And then you have to, of course, set the width and uh, you could also set the height if you're making different types of knobs. For this one, I just set the width uh, and then it automatically like adjusts the height accordingly. But if you need to make different shapes and sizes, sometimes putting width and height is helpful, okay? And then the text underneath it, how big is that text going to be? What's the size? What's the color? The color coding here, you can see is a little longer than the hexadecimal way of doing it, which is normal HTML. It's because these first two letters uh, allow for things like transparency or or uh, lay, like layering in a sense. That's, that's the way I've understood it. So you can make things more uh, transparent or more solid. And you can convert uh, the color hexadecimal you want and just go online and Google it to see how to write this in this longer format. Um, I think Android uses the same format as well. So uh, there's lots of resources online that you can Google and find. So these are all colors for this label, this knob. And then here, the label on it, it says attack. So that's what that text is going to say, attack and then you have to assign the minimum value you can give it. So when you turn it all the way down, it's zero. The max value is four. And the value it's gonna start at, that's where it says value, is zero. So it's gonna start on zero. Now, there are instruments sometimes that you might wanna make where that starting value is higher. Maybe you like the instrument with reverb. You want people to open it and immediately hear a little bit of reverb. And uh, there's also instruments where I've put the minimum value on something stuck on like a 0 0.2 or 0 0.4 just because it sounded better that way and that's how I wanted people to use it. I didn't want them to use it completely uh, without that effect on it. I wanted the effect to be a part of it. So that's uh, how this uh, knob is labeled, right? And then you tell what's its binding type. Well, what is it? It's bound as an amp. It falls under the amplifier of the instrument, right? And it's on the level of 
the instrument, which I actually just said, the amp of the instrument. Um, and the position is zero, and the parameter, what is it controlling, is the effect on underscore attack. Now, if you want to look at all the different effects that Dave Hillowitz has on his uh, Decent Sampler documentation, you can go to the Decent Samples website and see all the different parameters you can control. And he's working on more, I think. So uh, I think that will keep expanding as we go. And uh, so, yeah, you have all these different labeled knobs here that have all these different things. I, I went through the ones that are most important. Over here, you have uh, other things like translation output and translation table. Uh, I'm not going to go into those. That's more specific. For those ones, I would say, hey, if it ain't broke, don't try to fix it. If you get to the point where you want to mess with those things, you can always go research that on the Decent Samples website. So at the end of making a labeled knob here, you have to do these slash labeled knobs. So you're saying, I am not talking about this labeled knob anymore. I'm done. And then you make a new labeled knob. So these are the knobs that are on the instrument. Let me open that up over here. So here you can see them, right? I've positioned them a reverb a little lower. Uh, I'm not done yet obviously. And then here you see I'm closing that tab, the main tab, and I'm closing the UI. I'm not going to talk about the user interface anymore. I'm now going to focus on my groups. So first of all, there's a general groups tag over here. And you can actually also give your group a tag or label. Um, but I'm going to put tag and it's going to be claustrophobic Toy Piano Soft will be the tag, okay? The attack is going to be set to zero. The decay is set to zero. The sustain is set to one, and the release is set to zero. If you don't know what attack, decay, sustain, and release are, I have another video that talks about synthesis where I go into this more detailed. Um, and here I've set the volume at one decibel. So this is going to start off one dB uh, rather than zero. And then here I've made a group. The group is called the Claustrophobic Toy Piano. So I've tagged it as the Claustrophobic Toy Piano. Uh, I'm saying that the samples within this group will just play at 1 dB. So this is boosted slightly for all the groups, but these samples specifically aren't being boosted. And making sure this envelope sustain here is staying at 1 so that we can hear the sound. It doesn't cut off. And here, this is important, sequence length. The sequence length is quite important. I've put it to five here. I actually have seven round robins for a lot of my samples. That's what I originally wanted to record. But not all my samples managed to get clean, good sounding seven round robins. Now in Reasons and NXT, this isn't a problem. I simply just tell NXT, okay, this sample has five. This one has seven, this one has eight round robins, and it handles that per sample fine. But in Decent Sampler, I have to tell the sequence length to the programming. So if I set the sequence length to seven, and some of my samples only have five samples, then the six and the seventh, it messes it up. And um, that's what I've had in the past. So unless Dave Hillowitz fixed this since uh, that's my understanding of it, that where it, it would mess up because it wouldn't have a six and a seventh in the sequence, so I would hear nothing. So what I've done is I've set the sequence length to five over here because I know for sure that I have at least five samples for all my notes. So here you can see, we've talked already about the high note, the low note, the low velocity, the high velocity, so these are all my softer sounding hits and the root note. And then here you can see I've put the sequence position into each sample. And here you can see we have a sixth one, but we're not going to have that guy. We're going to delete the sixth one. So there's only five samples. So now is the point where I would have to insert all the samples that I want to use in one go and make sure all of them have the right sample coding for low note, high note, low velocity, high velocity, root note, of course the sample path and the sequence position. Now I'm going to uh, 
probably not show you guys me doing that because it will take me hours. So I will just um, skip ahead. But I did want to show you a quick hack, a way that you can do that faster on Windows computers. Uh, that makes it a little bit easier to manage that step. Okay, so when you are selecting your files, your samples that you want to import, you can actually grab them all and you can do shift, you hold shift, you right click and you click copy as path. And that allows you to paste the path information into Sublime Text. So here I've just copied as path my quiet, quieter samples, not the loud ones. And so when I go control paste, you'll see that all the samples paths are now here in quotes, which is very handy. Obviously, it doesn't read the same, right? Here it's giving the entire uh, folder name. That's a little bit unhandy. I'll have to remove that. But I can also do that quite quickly in one go with all of them. So to select and make this cursor go across multiple lines, I do Control, Alt, and I can press down. And you can see that it's selecting all these different samples uh, lines in one go. So it's uh, addresses. So I'm going to scroll down a bit and make sure that continues. And a little further, there's a lot of samples for this. And here we go. And I can remove all that in one go. And now, as you can see, I just have samples backslash claustrophobic piano. I need to change that to forward slash. So I remove all the backslashes and put a forward slash. And now we have samples forward slash claustrophobic piano. And we're doing every other note uh, in this file uh, pathfinding that we need to program in. Then I can do the same thing over here where I can create whoop, sample. I press tab for that because it's recommending that I write sample already. It's kind of trying to uh, tell me what they think I'm going to write based on the information in the document. It's predicting low note. Correct. Going to leave that blank for now because that's going to be different for each sample. And then high note. Oh, sorry. One sec. I got to put uh, equals there. There we go. And then we go high note. High note equals, I'm going to leave that blank as well. And then, of course, we have to go low velocity equals. And then we get to high velocity. I don't know why it's scrolling down for me automatically there. That's not so handy. All right. And we put that one in. And then, of course, we need our root note equals and then give that a place. Now, what we have is each one of these samples has been given a code, a bit of code that I can go through and edit the low note, high note, low velocity, high velocity, etc. Uh, oh, I made one mistake there, I see. Hold on, that's supposed to say high L. Okay. So we got root note, and now as you can see, we also need to say the path equals. And then we're going to put a quote there, and now all of these have a path directory. Um, as you can see over here, some of these samples are a little longer, so it's now got a little selection problem over there where these ones over here aren't at the same spot at the end. So I need to make sure to look out for that. I want to make sure that doesn't happen. So what I'm going to do instead is just select these lines till here and finish up that bit of code. Add the sequence position there, sequence position equals. And then there we go. That one's done. And I'm going to add that over here as well, etc. So I'm not going to show you guys this whole process of me inputting all this information, but I hope that that little uh, way of setting the path and pasting that uh, will speed up your programming process significantly. If you guys know even better ways to do it even faster, let me know. I would love to hear it. All right. So that was, in a nutshell, 
well, in more than 20 minutes, how you go about uh, programming a decent sample instrument. I hope this video was useful. If you've been interested but hesitant to do it, it is easier than you might think. Once you kind of get the hang of it, it really does start to get easier. I hope you go out and make some cool instruments yourself. Uh, they don't have to be as complex as this one with uh, many round robins. Um, but I hope this video at least allows you to feel like, hey, this is something I could do as well. Hope you guys have a great day or night wherever you are, and I'll see you next time. Peace.